Welcome back a brand new episode of Two Please. I am your host Abhin. And I am your co-host Rohit. Uh, I've just I had an epiphany you. like uh, yeah, two oh, minutes God. back. <laughs> I've been using my wired earphones for so long and Abhin has been suffering for it. Because I just missed one setting, like one setting in the options. Uh, it's so much better. Uh, already we're off to a good start. already like me in the future is probably celebrating you know you've seen those memes of people like celebrating vigorously i feel like uh, that's that's yeah. going to be me even when i start to edit this and i mean how else would i have lived up to my luddite uh, title right i mean famously luddite so i had oh to make God. it <laughs> okay never mind anyways Haan. so what are we talking about today i mean Today, uh, Rohit came up with an idea, and it is I, not an idea because this, there's a recent event or an event that is going to happen in a couple of weeks or in next week by the time this pod is out, it should be out. So, a bunch of movies are re-releasing uh, on September 13th, and one of them is a 2018 Indian uh, folk horror film called Tumbad. Tumbad, Tumbad. I don't know how it's pronounced. How's it pronounced? Tumbad. Yeah, Tumbad. Yeah, Tumbad. Tum- okay. Now this movie came out in 2018 and I watched it for the first time in 2020 or like yeah, I'd say 2020 fell in love with it like one of my favorite original like like pieces of original indian cinema to this date right so uh, yeah. it's releasing theaters and it's also one of rohit's favorite films uh, in, in the same context we have yes. spoken about it in passing on one of the monsters under our bed episodes right i don't remember where i remember like talking about it for a couple of minutes but uh, when i read that it was getting re-released next week or around the time when you guys listen to it i was like hey let's this gives us a great excuse to talk about them but i just needed one and uh, hmm. the hope is uh, for the whatever number of people in india listening to us uh, this acts as a trigger if you haven't watched the movie i i hope this episode nudges you to go and watch the movie because if you love horror films if you love horror films that are rich in folklore uh, and you often wondered why can't india put out uh, a film that is rooted in its own mythology feels indian and you know is not um, taking western tropes and just putting a rapper on them uh, that film exists and it's called tumbal but uh, before we get ahead of ourselves let's start the show Let us uh, jump into this. So, like we said, uh, Tumbad was released in 2018, directed yes. by Rahi Anil Barve is his name. Um, I think there were four writers in the mix, so it was a very collaborative process. Uh, Anand Gandhi was the producer. I think Soham Shah also came on as a producer actor. And again, Anand Gandhi and Soham Shah have some equity in the indie circles because of Ship of the Seas. So, I think their participation really helped. push the film across the line what really helps this film and we we'll, we we'll, i i'll i want to spend time on this when we dive deeper is uh, barve's previous background as as a an animation artist right and it hmm. really shines across in the set design in the color palette of the film in the cinematography uh, it's it's brilliant right um so very like unknown set of folks i mean think about it so amsha and anand gandhi are the most known people in the room uh it's a hmm. fairly unknown set of uh, individuals who decided to bring uh, this vision to life and i think the story is either inspired by or a, or an adaptation of uh, the works of narayan dhap who is this marathi pulp horror fiction writer uh hmm. who also adapts stephen king works into marathi for for those who want mm-hmm. to read it right so and again right. you see a lot of that aesthetic uh in the film as well anyway long story short small scale production very diverse bunch of people even the cast a lot of them come from the marathi uh, dramatic circle so again made on a budget but had a very clear vision uh, which shines through the the entirety of the film right it's a classic case of uh, if you don't have i mean if you have the right vision money isn't as much of a problem while we've seen bloated bullshit uh, our fair share of bloated bullshit as well right money is thrown on actors and set 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 up but there is no story this is the exact other yeah. end of the spectrum which is so right off the bat I, like philosophically i love the film right so when i read about it uh, i was already like cool i i'm in a mind to like the film and uh, 
and then i watched it uh, but again uh, before we get into first impressions so yeah that's that's the broad uh, bts story of making of uh, dumbat released in 2018 like you said uh, won some awards in at the film fairs i think more of the technicals and maybe a critics choice fairly uh, atypical right small budget film uh, set in uh, it's not it's not in marathi but it's very steeped in the maharashtrian culture marathi, right? so, yes exactly it's it's not it's not got a punjabi or a north indian bias like most Bo- bollywood films so obviously yes. it got ignored uh, it, it <laughs> didn't get its time in the sun because unless you have a kapoor or a sharma or a varma in your film nobody gives a fuck in this country right so uh, it is what it is uh, sorry i'm just always perennially going to be irritated at how film is uh, critically evaluated and rewarded in this country but any anyway, besides the point because like the word are <laughs> my wife is a sharma just for the record <laughs> but uh... <laughs> and you are half maharashtra in the two now are you not yes <laughs> i am i am <laughs> uh, so oh any anyway. A uh, films like tumbad in my opinion are are beyond uh, award recognition and stuff uh, film fair is too pedestrian for uh, a, a work of art like tumbad uh, but anyway i can keep babbling on and you know uh, wax eloquent about it but uh, let's get into first impressions i mean what was your first impression when you watched this film for you though oh dude when i first watched this movie i i'd heard like stories about it i'd heard it of being i just moved so this was one of those films that got caught in the middle and usually if a mo- i hear about atmospheric indian horror film that's getting rave reviews i'm in the theater i'd moved and this was a time where i was like in the midst of adjusting to new surroundings so i had no time to go check out stuff right uh, i didn't st- uh, step into a movie theater for a couple of months and by the time the movie had come and gone the hype had like hype cycle had risen and fallen and i was like okay it's something at the back of my mind i want to want to check it out at some point i remember the pandemic so i saw it at a friend's place we sat down it was just me and her dogs and we i think for like the movie is about 2 hours just a little over 2 hours mm-hmm. and yeah. for the entirety of the 2 hours i was just transfixed because i couldn't believe that there was a director out there or there were like a bunch of creatives out there who capable of putting something so atmospheric so dark and so wonderful on screen um it's it's not in a traditional in the sense in the traditional sense of the word a horror film yes there is like there is there are elements of horror in it i think the more you dig into the film the more you uncover like or the, the recesses right that humans will 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 dip to to just kind of um just purely for the agreed and this was and i've thought the film the, on my first viewing i was like hey that's a theme that i've picked up on and i will get to it in some point but i remember coming out of it being like i am so amazed that somebody made a movie like it it's not perfect i i kind of there are points of the film yeah. where the pacing dips a little bit here and there the animations whenever i, I mean i can't, i will not fault a low budget film that took 15 to 18 years to make for uh, for bad animation but it's it definitely a little clunky in parts so but all that said i as a visual experience this is a movie i recommend to people all across like you may not have no understanding of the hindi language you may be a complete foreigner to hindi films like i have like friends in the west and um, i will suggest this as a piece of original indian horror uh, that they can check out and have a good time with not be scared it's something like even my mom watched it because i was so she hates horror movies in general i made her watch it and she was she came across quite uh, happy with it as well mm. i remember my first um, i remember the first time i watched this movie right and this was um, i think around the time it had released i didn't i don't think it got a very wide release in india and fairly soon it was on ott platforms um but i recall correctly it was amazon prime yes yeah it was amazon prime and um so i was at home when i'd come back from work this was in chennai when i was living with my roommate who also before he had done his mba and where we'd met and worked together in itc he had previously worked in the tech team of a theater chain movie theater chain so as a result of his job he would watch a lot of movies like he'd be there right so he had a good eye for film also uh again not to say again not to sound bougie but you get what i mean right he's not just watching for the heck of it uh so i remember uh, t- turning the film on firstly again um, 
end of work day and this was a friday i think so it was also eminent weekend we were chemically altered let's put it that way <laughs> and i i popped the film in and um, so the immediate the movie starts with i think if i remember correctly it's the gandhi quote uh, the world has enough for everyone's need but not their mm. greed and it dives into setting the mythology for the movie right which is the story of hastar which is that hastar was the first born of uh, uh mother earth and uh, mm. he wanted to steal all the gold and the food right and uh, it's set, right off the bat it sets the story and i was like i remember thinking wow this is like i didn't expect this right? i didn't expect such yeah. a deep rooted indian mythology and I, right off the bat both me and my roommate were like wow okay i'm i'm already interested right and uh, then uh, the first half an hour of the movie and i i'd like to slightly modify what you said abin which is Yes, I wouldn't call it an out and out horror movie because the horror elements aren't present through the movie. In fact, the second half essentially is a human character study. The first half yes. an hour though is fucking scary. <laughs> right? Yeah, it is. Uh, mm. At least that one sequence towards the end of the first half an hour, uh, and especially after. Okay, so we uh, before I dive in, there will be spoilers. We are doing spoilers, right? So yeah, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, yeah. How can we talk about the part or not? Mm, exactly yeah. mm. so the the part from where his brother falls and to the end of that first act it should mm. just go 0 to 100 in like 5 minutes right yeah. so uh, yeah. i remember and the lighting of and this is what i was mentioning right is his background as an animation artist the lighting of that wada the house is outstanding like chef's kiss right you see the shadows of the candlelight flicker across and what i've seen is this dichotomy right in tumbar all of the exterior shots are blue gray it's constantly raining it's got that like washed out uh, feel but all interior yeah. shots are candle lit there you know red walls there's there's uh, shades of yellow ochre red orange yeah. all of that uh, same with the womb where where hastar is womb of the earth uh, so this, i love this dichotomy i love the color palette and how vividly contrasting it is right and you see in the house uh those those candle shadows flickering and they've taken this kind of long shot you know of the corridor where uh they her, her, his mother hesitates to feed that aji that is there in in their house mm-hmm. and uh just the way the shots are framed you as a viewer start feeling dread and like i said in the state that we were uh me and my roommate were like uh dude i'm feeling something in the pit of my stomach it's like the sort of dread which i haven't felt in a hindi horror movie in a while like for the most part i'm always like bro some some crap right uh and then the that sequence started uh where sadashiv or as you say in the marathi accent sadashiv when sadashiv mm-hmm. falls from the tree and his mom has to rush him to the doctor and uh, vinayak has to feed the the our protagonist vinayak has to feed the grandma that 10 minutes happened and then we paused and i turned to my roommate and we were like bro we should not have taken anything before watching this movie <laughs> i am not in a good place mentally right now i need a break we took a break uh drank some water washed our face and now we'll continue and i thought the rest of the movie is like this intense right it is intense in other ways yeah. but uh, hmm. we didn't get bored at any stage but on i'll be honest apart from you is like thank god that was the scariest part and we're done with it yeah <laughs> but what a movie no no that, that yeah no that that opening 20 minute section which is basically it sets up okay so there's background for those of you who are still here but haven't really been able to keep up so there's a goddess like mother earth who gives birth to this yeah. uh, to his to their son to her son called uh, hastar and hastar is a greedy bastard who goes after the gold and just as he's about to go after the after the grain he's stopped by the other gods and uh, the other gods want to kill him but mother earth kind of makes a deal saying as long as uh, keep him alive and i'll make sure he just stays in my womb and the villagers of tumbard uh, decide to like revolt against the other gods and you know um and worship hastar instead and the other gods curse them with torrential rain so it is perpetually raining in tumbard that and which is why mm. this film literally drips atmosphere <laughs> So the film yes. opens up with uh this woman who is the caretaker for the local sarkar it's i think it's early 1900s 1910s 18 yeah. 1918 or something right? No i think it's like so, 1918 1920 type so. Yeah yeah so 
definitely around that that time period so she's like the local caretaker uh and she's taking care of this guy who's this big gouted individual who's on death's door while also taking care of two kids and this really old uh, haggard old 112 year old lady uh, who claims to be the sarkar or like the owner's great great grandmother or something who because yeah. of a of a curse from her sister is unable to die so she's just cursed with perpetual immortality she cannot die of natural causes so she just keeps getting gold and she's and perpetually this, hungry this becomes important yes. yeah she is perpetually hungry so she needs to be fed and so this mother is kind of losing her shit and one fine day i think she's away and the kids are playing and uh uh so that she was as you say he so kind of falls shoe. from the tree <laughs> shoe <laughs> he falls yes. from the tree and they end up taking so the mother takes him to the hospital leaving vinayak the older son to um feed the feed the old lady and that old lady basically goes for vinayak and it is a very terrifying 15 to 20 minute sequence <laughs> that shot yeah. in yeah in darkness and candlelight as rohit mentioned and it ends it ends with uh Vinayak and his mother leaving to Pune. I think they they they, they just yeah. say screw this place. Uh, the the old man dies. This woman is still being an ass. So they're like, let's just get out of here. And many years later, the story picks up with Vinayak coming back to the house of Tumbad, and he goes to the old lady who is now like grown into the into the earth. She is now like the tree that's sprouting out of her. Yeah. And this is where she tells him the secret that. Uh, of this womb hidden beneath the sarkar's house that will you know that that he can that he can then use to go and trick hastar to give him gold coins and that's yeah. where the movie essentially starts and because of and for this trade off he ends up killing her and this is where your movie begins yeah i think that's that's uh, as much as as good a setup as you can give without getting into further details obviously uh, things happen we, we will address those specific spoilers and maybe in the thematic section because we can't discuss the themes of the film without spoiling it but this is essentially the setup i think i think well put uh, but yeah those are our first impressions fairly long first impressions uh, mm-hmm. we can quickly do any memorable moments over and above the ones we've discussed and then we can get mm-hmm. into the theme i think that's the meat of the matter i didn't think they were going to do a creature so i was very surprised when i saw a creature i just thought it was a local yeah. i didn't know that they were going to do that so when the creature popped up i was like oh okay you're doing this like this is interesting i i have not seen and it's not like a ramsey brothers creature which were so used to in indian cinema right like either yeah there hasn't been a creature feature since the early 90s because of what the ramsey brothers did to indian cinema if okay. i if there is i've I kind of I might have missed there's a muck dee or, or like but she's a witch I don't know this yeah, she's a witch yeah it's not the same no. it's all humanoid I mean even Hastur is humanoid but there is mm. no trace of humanity he's out he might have two legs and two hands but he's out and out a monster like it's a creature yeah, yeah. so yeah so that seeing it for the first time I was just like holy shit yeah uh, and His first appearance the ad- and the other thing I really liked and this is section throughout the film is the depiction of india in that from the put it from the time of the british raj right up to post independence where this movie kind of mm. concludes and how india keeps changing and that to me was a really fascinating watch and not a lot of movies take us through that time period uh, and they don't and they don't do it very well at all no that's true and I, and it's it's uh, not only is it faithful to the era it's also faithful to the geography in the era right if you if you look at uh, the attire and the sort of food they are shown eating again i'm not stayed in pune per se but i stayed in bombay so and i like you said i'm half marathi so i have some some <laughs> insight into the world uh if i were to extrapolate what things would be 100 years ago it, it's a fairly good representation i feel so mm. uh, it's like I, like i said it's not only era appropriate it's also geography appropriate so i completely agree with you there uh for me the memorable moments um, like i said the first 20 25 minutes or whatever far and away the most memorable uh, bit for me but uh, apart from that uh first appearance of hastar like like you said but also at the end when when the the whole twist happens right where uh, um vinayak and his son pandurang think they found mm. a way to outsmart hastar and then yes. 
again i won't spoil it right now we'll talk about it when we get to the theme section but something happens and you're like damn <laughs> they just got out smarted by mother nature i just like no you think you're the smartest person in the room you're not uh, that was an epic moment for me when i was like okay uh, i i thought the film had written itself into a corner not in this uh, or in the sense that hey you're going to make the protagonists win Yeah, mm. it dilutes the moral lesson you're trying to leave us with, and like, then yeah. that thing happens, and then they're like, "No, this movie is fucking <laughs> awesome, back on track." So that I would also like to mention an unmemorable moment, or rather, I wouldn't call it an unmemorable moment per se, but a section. And like you rightly said, right, the film is clunky in parts. The whole uh, track about uh, Vinayak's mistress, who is that yeah. OPM trader's daughter-in-law, Raghav, or whatever his daughter-in-law. Mm. i felt it was it it took away from the core plot of the film i get i understand the point they were trying to make it's era appropriate how, yeah it is era appropriate and it's trying to make a point about patriarchy and how he's he's uh, you know his wife is being short changed and because he has money uh, it's showing how toxic patriarchy mixed with uh, power and wealth can be But I'm like, it's fine. There, are, you 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 already landed the message of greed and power in in the course of the film so far. So I felt it sort of took away from the film. Um, that's probably my only narrative gripe. Uh, any other gripe would be budget related, graphics and stuff. But yeah, that's, you know, that's, you get a pass. They get a pass. That's very unfair. Yeah, yeah, it's very unfair. Yeah, exactly. For us to do that, they get a pass yeah. for it. But yeah, those were my memorable moments. Uh, I think let's dive into the theme because I really want to get into that. This movie deals with, and I think the most common one is the cycle of greed, right? It's greed. So yes. this since the beginning, since starting with the birth of Hastur and his whole thing, like this, the central theme that runs through the entire story is greed about how greed corrupts, it consumes, and then destroys. Uh, and the film, told through its three acts, kind of just. showcases that at the start is the gold that corrupts and in the second half it's, it fully consumes him and by the th- and in the end of the, the third act it fully destroys and i like how there are consequences to that greed sprinkled throughout the film like no matter he may be earning a lot of wealth but there's that saying that you know that uh, ill gotten wealth never like like has a price to pay regardless or something mm-hmm. along those lines right Like his son is born with a clock. It's not like you made uh, that up. <laughs> made it up on the fly. I know there is a saying like that, but you were so far away. I just, I was just like, oh, you know, it's been a long day, guys. I'm sorry. Um, it's if you want the the accurate description, I would put it up on screen. The, you got the essence of it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> importantly. No, but I completely agree. The, at, at the core of the film is the is the. concept i it's it's not difficult i mean it's not fair to call it a concept it's larger it's a theme of uh the perpetuation of greed right uh, but i'd also like to add another bit of nuance to it i think what the film does over the course of the movie is at the start it it gives you this message that it probably pays to be sinful than being virtuous because Mm. Look at the influences that Vinayak as a boy is seeing, right? He, he sees Sarkar being this uh, old guy who's rich, and because he's rich, he can also pursue his lustful desires. His mom is essentially they show her the having to give this almost yeah eight year old guy a hand job, and uh, which is a horror movie in and of itself, right? I'm not even going to go down that route. Uh, I could, but I won't. <laughs> No, please don't. Please, it's been a little. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, anyways, right? You can see uh, the the lessons that Vinayak is learning as a younger child is hey, there's nothing wrong with pursuing cardinal sins, greed, lust, uh, quest for power, um, and you can see even as a kid, you you see his you see him pushing his mom, saying hey, why are we leaving Tumbar? You only got one gold coin. Why can't we go back? And he feels. Hmm. uh because of the servitude his mom had to undergo he feels entitled to the treasure of the place right yeah so there is arrogance there's pride there's essentially he's got a smorgas board of the original sins that he is indulging in right as and that's this is just as a kid right pushing his mom saying hey no we deserve we are entitled to all of it we should go back and get it and 
apart from his mom almost rejecting him and sort of you know smacking sense into him and saying you will not go back to tu but promise me and all of that he's not punished for uh, wanting to indulge in these sins and in the first half of the movie you see that his ambition his greed is paid off is paying off for him right he undertakes the effort of going back and figuring out how to get the coins from hastar and the whole uh, fund of making flour you know flour dough or whatever dolls and stuff and it starts paying him off uh, we see him as somebody who's poor but because of his bravery and this is in his mind and the film showcases it as bravery right it, it says bravery in the pursuit of greed he gets those coins pays this raghav guy off starts becoming rich and the first half of the film you're almost made to feel is this movie telling me it's is this like wall street right greed is good i just about i was coming to that <laughs> the wolf of tumbad <laughs> yeah <laughs> full of the word i sent him like is that what this movie is trying to tell me uh but as the movie progresses you start seeing that uh sin corrupts you more subliminally more uh it, it's not as obvious right uh and the benefits of being good um uh, is also very subtle in the beginning and it starts becoming more obvious with the very obvious end at the at the end it's very obvious where his son decides to break this cycle of greed right this perpetuity of greed so there's almost like a the, the uh, message of good being good starts off subtly and reaches a crescendo while message of you know evil being good starts off very overt and then becomes very subtle and it, it talks about how nice. being bad is bad for you so this tonal balance the, the film balances this uh, tonal the duality of tone brilliantly i feel and this is not something i caught in the first few the yeah. the greed bit is you know they hammer you over the head with it but there's yeah. a lot happening uh, second third degree below the surface which upon repeat viewings i was like this movie is a fucking masterpiece absolutely uh like you and there's a moment like the moment we spoke about about how it becoming obvious that the sun was going to break the cycle of greed Uh, and i don't think the sun was ready to break the cycle of greed until something really important happened and the moment is basically yeah. the ultimate greed consumption like we spoke about how, how greed consumes beautifully done it was just like hey hello meet the result of your like like meet your consequences yeah, yeah. actions meet consequences consequences. <laughs> consequences exactly right no i completely agree right i think uh, when mm. his son pandoran sees that in the pursuit of uh that loin cloth which signifies like the apex greed right because now if you have the loin cloth it's like your uh in theory your your greed should be met for perpetuity but what he realizes mm. is that and and this is where i want to make the other point right like i'll come back to what, what i just the thought i just started but uh in the grandma and even in in vinayak when he's bitten by hastar at the end the monster that they become i think the allegory that they're also trying to land here is your inner ugliness and your inner greed and monstrosity is now outwardly manifesting right it was there mm-hmm. inside you all along the monster is inside all of us uh, the ones who have uh, you know us who have let greed drive us too far now that monstrosity mm-hmm. is out for all to see right and yeah. um that is exactly what pandurang sees when he sees vinayak in the pursuit of his greed while you have uh achieved what you thought was you know uh the satisfaction of your greed for perpetuity you have had to sacrifice your humanity so to speak in 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 its pursuit and i think that's when he gets the realization that now that i have this uh you will always covet what you don't have right you might have endless wealth there'll be something else and uh the pursuit of that something else will require you to give up some more of your humanity right so unless you can train yourself or unless you decide hey i'm content and i'm not going to keep uh, perpetually wanting more things there's no end to it i think that's the realization that hits pandora he's like the only way to like break this is to walk away right now i need to take that decision and i think all of that realization falls on him in those 10 seconds where he sees his dad even after being bitten he's like hey this is what you wanted right take it let let it all be mm-hmm. worth something and he's like no me walking away from the situation with some humanity intact is worth more than that loin cloth can ever be right that's that's yeah. the final thought that the movie wants you to walk away with yeah fuck fuck it's phenomenal 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, any more okay, themes so, to discuss? Uh, I mean, a brief word on the. I mean, we already touched upon this, but again, they've alluded to it. I wouldn't say they've been very explicit with it, but they've shown how even with independence coming in, the same sort of power structures, the same uh, collusion with uh, you know people in power, the same patriarchal cycles being perpetuated, continued. and uh, it's just you know new rulers of more familiar skin tones maybe not not as white but uh, the people who are repressed continue to be repressed uh, it shows it again like i said it's not very explicit it lets you infer it from the way events are unfolding on screen um, like we like in the first half of the movie you have that british inspector who's extorting raghav mm. for money In the second half of the movie, you have the government of India coming in and saying, uh, "You know, he they're being bribed by Vinayak to. Uh, I think he's giving some sort of donation uh, to you know for them to turn a blind eye to his illegal activities and his opium consumption and stuff." So you hmm. see the same same corruption, same cycles uh, continue. So again, not a major theme, but that's something that it alludes to, and I, I feel. somehow it doesn't feel like the film is juggling too much uh, it manages to land this theme like there's that brief it's a brief bit about colonialism it kind of like the impact of colonialism where you like the previous regimes are corrupt like you said like just piggy backing off of your point the previous regimes corrupt corrupt uh, moves eventually kind of find a feet in the new in, in like you said feminist skin tones new, new yeah. rulers right uh, and this was like I, it's wasn't it quite common a lot of the zamindar uh, lands were being reacquired by the government post independence there are a bunch of other films that have also i think famously that come to mind lutera also deals with the subject where the government mm-hmm. starts taking back land that uh, like these famous these sarkar types people owned um, and essentially eliminating their class completely And yeah, I think the whole transition of princely states to post-colonial India is very fascinating. It's a very fascinating mm. study in and of itself, right? Up until I think seventy-three, mm. when the privy purse, the national privy purse, was finally abolished, uh, mm. these these were people who were you know as privileged as can be. You come from royal families, and they were still getting paid a certain sum of money every year by the government. And as a common man, you. You sit and think, you're like, what the fuck, right? Here we're struggling for mm-hmm. like, uh, okay, we're not exactly struggling to make ends meet, but we have aspirations that are still always a little out of our grasp. These guys are just sitting and getting things yeah. done for them. And I recently went to Rajasthan for a trip with with Poonam, and so even when I was there, I was seeing the castles that these royal families lived in. These royal families still exist today, right? The Jodhpur royal mm-hmm. family still exists today, and so does the Jaisalmer royal family. i think they make like a significant amount of like 30 40 lakhs a month off of the rentals they get off their properties what they've leased to hotels mm. and farmland i'm like fuck you all man seriously nothing changed right in like 300 years nothing or whatever changed, right. nothing changed no, democracy for the rest of us mooks <laughs> get out of the game as fast as you can <laughs> seriously basically <laughs> Mm. Just for the rest of us, mooks. But anyway, But that's yeah. the that's the yeah. other theme that that uh, Dumba talks about. So though some of you might have noticed, I I haven't really tried to uh, shoehorn any of my exaggerated uh, actual humor here, because uh, this is not that kind of film, right? It's it's a please please don't. I don't think don't, there's yeah. any humor yeah. in this film. Yeah, it's not. I I don't want to shoehorn it. I don't I don't no. want to. Ta- I I just want to. spend this episode just talking about how much i love this film it's beautiful it's serious it's deep it's dark it's beautifully shot it's the passion that goes into the project shines through every frame of the film uh spectacular mm. performances across the board um in my opinion soham shah is probably the weakest of the lot and that's not me being critical probably a little immersion breaking for me because his his marathi pronunciation is good Yes, but I heard people said this. He's yeah. not Maharashtra. Mm. Yeah, everyone yeah. else in the in the cast, if I'm not mistaken, is Maharashtra. So, mm. uh, if if like if like you have an ear for it, you're like ah, uh, yeah, that's that's my only uh, concern. Great with it, great with him. Uh, otherwise, he's he's acted really well. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I could keep going, but I, I love this movie. Yeah, I mean, I kind of want to quickly talk about it's like the the sad impact it had on Indian cinema, as in we like this should have been a revival of folk horror, but a lot of really poorly thought of low budget horror films have come in its stead. Uh, I think horror comedies have become a genre. Like people, those have said cash and disturbed is ringing, but the genre itself mm. hasn't received any sort of boost that I thought it would receive after uh, this See, film. I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about three, right? Which is three two is comedy. running full screens, right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, the, I've seen the the first one. I haven't seen the second one. It is a horror comedy, mm. all right. Uh, I mean, mm. the comedy part of this is questionable, but whatever they, they want to purport to be comedy it's good good for them in their in, in i mean in its defense though even three is rooted in some very indian folklore right so yes i mean it's nowhere in terms of quality nowhere close to tumba i'm not even going to okay, assert okay. that but at least it's rooted in, it's it's it feels indian one other indian horror film which again is super rooted is super geography and era specific and is fucking amazing is bulbul Hmm. Oh, is it? Have okay. You, have you watched? Uh, Tripti no, it's uh, Anna, was, uh, it's this on one. Uh, on Anna, Anushka Sharma's produced, right? I know, I know of the film. Yes. 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 I'm forgetting mm-hmm. the director's name. It's a uh, it's a woman director, and again, you can tell there's I don't know. There's just some depth to characters that women directors bring to the table, which I think they just understand human characters better than men. This is down to that. That is. Hmm. Characters are so very fleshed out, and uh, Bulbul played by uh, the Dimri her character is super again rooted in I wouldn't say presidency era Bengal slightly later again I would say eighteen nineties early nineteen hundreds Bengal, um, very Bengali, uh, very era specific. Uh, you have these zamindars Rahul Bose plays zamindar and stuff. Uh, he has a double role in fact. Uh, Tripti Dimri is awesome in the film. I think that was her unveiling to the world in a sense, although not her mm. debut film. Rooted in the Indian uh, Chudel lore, and it's not mm. not Chudel as in which of the Western. Like Chudel has its own lore in India, right? So yeah, amazing film. I, that's the only one I would say is is in the same is in the same uh, stratosphere or whatever, same uh, level of Tumbad. Tumbad and Bulbul are. Probably my, if I had to pick, say, five favorite Indian horror films of all time, they would be in those in that mix. Okay. Awesome. If you haven't, I haven't checked guys, out Bulbul, again, Abin or anyone else, yes, please do, please do. It's beautiful. Hmm. Okay, this is that is part of the plan. Uh, okay, I think we're almost at the end. We've kind of like waxed eloquent about Tumbard. We've also done the themes. I've spoken briefly about its impact. Uh, I we kind of debated about this back going back and forward about how we should do this category or not not do this category, but we have decided to do it anyway because you know who cares if we don't do it or not. Yeah, and and I um, kept this uh, little uh, factoid of the film. Uh, I didn't talk about it. I kept it for this section. So this is how Abhin and I debated it. Right? Uh, we were like, how do you connect <laughs> an Indian horror film to? Uh, Gone Girl, because that's the section you're talking about is Six Degrees of Gone Girl. And then I remembered that the f- score for this film, while Ajay Atul have made, I've done one song. There's just one song in the film. They've composed that. But the score, like the background score of the film is by fucking Jesper Kids of all people. Now, uh, for those of you who may have found this name familiar, you may have heard of uh, Jesper Kid from the gaming circles. Uh, most famously for Assassin's Creed games, for the Hitman games. I actually knew of him from the Hitman games. There's a piece of his called Apocalypse in the fourth one, Blood Money. Amazing song. It's like super operatic. It's very atmospheric. Uh, so even like separately from all of this, I'm a huge fan of Jess Puckett just for his uh, game soundtracks. And then Abin found a connection. So Abin, how are we How are we get, going from Tumbad to Gone Girl? Let's, let's... Uh, okay. Let's break this okay. down. Like Rohit gave, just yeah, like Rohit gave Jasper Kid his flowers. I will give him his flowers too. There is a game I have been playing since two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. It has been <laughs> fifteen years since that bloody game came out, which is Assassin's Creed Two. Which, in my opinion, has the best opening to one one of the best openings to a video game of all time. Right? It has 
that cutscene and the the theme song Ezio's family, which has now become Ubisoft's Ezio, theme song. Door, so, yeah, like his his theme song is oh, it's so damn good, and it opens up with yeah. Ubisoft presents, and I said oh, it's, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Anyway, the just for kid good. Uh, so I decided to make the connection to Assassin's Creed. So I said okay, fine. Since we're using like producers, music directors. Uh, let's let's go down this route. So Jasper Kate did the music for Assassin's Creed 2. Kristen Bell plays Alice or someone, I forget her character's name, is uh, in Assassin's Creed 2. Now, let's no. find a connection. So Kristen Bell was in Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Correct, with, I would have. Yeah, with uh, Jason Siegel. All right. Okay. Okay, do you want to take Jason Siegel? Do you have Jason Siegel? You have Mila Kunis. You have uh, Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd also is connected yes. to a lot of folks. Hmm. We can take. Uh, okay, I'll take Siegel. You take Rudd. Let's let's. Okay. Uh, maybe let's okay. do that. Oh, oh cool. So okay. what we want to do. So, I'll take Jason Siegel. So that makes Kristen. So just pick it. Kristen Bell, Jason Siegel. Um, I got it. Jason Siegel. Uh, Cameron Diaz uh, in in Sex Tape. Oh, which is this? Yeah, Cameron Diaz, Leo DiCaprio, Gangs of New York. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh my God! We're back to Departed you know and Matt Damon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Leo. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon. <laughs> The Departed Matt Damon. <laughs> ben Affleck, Good Will Hunting. We need to find a better connector than Good Will Hunting. I feel like we have now reached this point where it's only, only Good Will Hunting. I'm sure he's done no, more films. I mean, that's, that's, uh... <laughs> oh, okay, fine. Screw it. I mean, Matt yeah. Damon, Last Duel. Last Duel. Screw it. <laughs> yeah, Last, last Duel. There's, uh, there's also hmm. the Jay and Silent Bob movies. Yeah, we have, we have options. Yeah, Jay, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. There we, yeah, go. we can keep rotating. Dogma. Okay, let me try... <laughs> Let me try with Paul Rudd. Um, Paul Rudd, Anchorman, Steve Carell. Okay, so Paul Rudd was an Anchorman. Steve Carell was an Anchorman. Steve Carell was in Foxcatcher. Was Matt Damon in Foxcatcher? No. 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 That was Steve Carell, Channing Tatum. and This is not as easy as I thought it would be. Hey, maybe... Um, the Anchorman 2 had a bunch of cameos. Did Ben Affleck cameo in any of those? No, I didn't. Let me also think. I'm sure I can find a way. Damn, I thought Paul Rudd would be my way out. I know, you know what? I found it. Hmm. I found it. <laughs> Paul Rudd. Mm-hmm. Avengers Infinity War. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Chris Hemsworth, Ragnarok, yes. Matt Damon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot escape the Matt Damon. I was going to go Deadpool three, but he's not in Deadpool three. Spoilers for Deadpool three. Uh, he's yeah. even though he's alluded to in Deadpool three, but then that made a far more. Yeah, impressive connection. I was just like, I saw oh, okay, Paul in Avengers. Yeah, that. Mm-hmm. Hey, so fine for later. Paul at Avengers is also a great way to get into. Yeah, yeah. Matt Damon. Anybody just had to get anybody, to Matt Damon. <laughs> forget to Matt Damon. He's in, and we found him in the Avengers. He's mad. This man is everywhere. This man is no shame. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we somehow managed to connect a 2018 Indian horror film. Gone girl. There we go. We are yet to be defeated. Amazed. Thanks yes. to Jasper Kid. We are, yeah, thanks to Jasper Kid Hero. Goat. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's us for this week's episode. If you have not liked and subscribed to the video already, please do. Look at the silly shit we're up to on most weeks. How could like you and subscribe us. Varna us. Oh my god. Oh, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was bad. Cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'll come to keep it. <laughs> but yeah, that's us. Uh, we'll yeah. see you on the next one. As usual, 
we we we'll think of what we want to talk about a couple of days before we record no actually we have our next episode planned so we have a guest coming on so uh, i oh. have a friend of mine who is oh, a yeah, comic right. book artist yeah was a comic book artist uh, famously created the comic superhero musal man his name is falaf azro <laughs> uh he he is doing his best to like get sniped by the government for some bullshit but we're having him on our platform cuz he's a good friend and i love him uh and we will be discussing a uh, great comic book graphic novel adaptations that are in superheroes superhero movies that will be it'll make for a very fun episode i feel like some of you already have those of you listening you probably have ideas of where this episode is going to go that will be the next episode we need to record it like in the next 3 days so <laughs> at some okay. point this is yeah for you thanks for me. letting me know I today <laughs> <laughs> i told fala midweek and we're already in midweek anyway so yeah but yeah that's but yeah. that's coming that's coming up next and uh, yeah we'll catch you on that one until then take care see you we'll do a 60 Bye-bye. degrees of gone girl there as well like that yeah, that will that'll be, that'll be far easier, easier. Yeah. yeah yeah okay, okay. see ya bye bye